What's up guys, I'm Theo Joe, and today we're taking a look at the good old command prompt in Windows. Specifically, we've got nine useful, interesting, or just plain cool commands that are worth knowing about, and I think you'll like these. Before we jump in, I want to let you know about today's sponsor, Bitdefender, and their latest product, Bitdefender Total Security 2020. More than just an antivirus, it's a complete security suite covering all major platforms, namely Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. It's highly rated by independent labs and won product of the year from AV Comparatives and won best protection and best performance from AV Test. We can go into more details about all the features a little later, but be sure to check out the link in the description where you can get a special extended four month free trial for new users in the US and Canada, which will cover up to five of your devices. And with having said that, let's get into those command prompt commands. All right, so hopefully you already know how to get to the command prompt. You can just search CMD in the start menu and you can run it either regularly or some commands on here might require it to run as an administrator. The first command is a really cool one you've probably never heard of before called Cypher. This allows you to encrypt and decrypt files and folders on your computer and also securely erase files in free space. The command can be used on a new folder that's empty by typing Cypher, and then slash E to encrypt or slash D to decrypt, and then the path of the thing you want to encrypt. So we can create a folder just called folder in this example. Now, automatically, any files you put into that folder will be encrypted on the fly, and you'll see a little padlock on the icon to show that it's encrypted. If you want to encrypt a directory that already has files in it, you need to do it like this. Do you type cipher slash E slash S colon, and then the directory, and that will encrypt everything inside it currently and going forward. Now, the encryption key is tied to your user account, so it's not like you set a password or anything, it just automatically loads the key when you log on. So if you are not logged on to the computer, or if the computer is off, then the files will remain encrypted and inaccessible. After you encrypt a folder, you'll get a notification or a prompt to back up the encryption keys, which you should definitely do, maybe to a thumb drive or something, because if you ever have to copy those files off the computer during a recovery when not logged in, you will need the key file to decrypt them later. You can also probably back up the certificates by searching manage security certificates in the start menu and then going through that process. Another use of the cipher command is to overwrite any free space on a drive, ensuring that no deleted files can be recovered. Because if you didn't realize, when you delete a file, even from the recycle bin, the file isn't exactly erased right away. It's just marked as free space and the file can be potentially recovered until the sector on the hard drive is used to overwrite something else. So the command we would use here is the following. It's cipher slash W colon and then the drive letter with no spaces in the second part. It will then just overwrite that empty space on the drive by basically writing a huge temporary file. And if you keep refreshing Explorer, you can see that it keeps getting bigger, overwriting any free space, and then it just deletes itself when it's finished. All right, so moving on, the next command is ipconfig. This is a very useful command you might already know about, but basically displays information about all of your network adapters, such as the local IP address of the adapter. And if you type in ipconfig slash all, it shows even more detailed info, including the MAC address, aka the physical address of each adapter, which is a unique identifier and useful for identifying unknown devices sometimes. Then another parameter is ipconfig slash flush DNS which purges the DNS cache resolver, which is basically just the saved list of which IP addresses correspond to which websites. Sometimes this can be useful if you're having trouble accessing certain websites or they're misbehaving in some way, or you've changed around your network settings on your local network. It can't hurt and might come in handy if you can try it. Okay, on to number three, we have two commands that we'll just combine into one, and these are ping and tracert. The ping command is very simple. You just type ping and then the domain name or IP address and your computer will send out a packet asking for a response. If there is a response, you'll see how long each one took and it will also show the IP address associated with the domain. So if you are wondering what IP address a certain website has, this is a way to find out. Though keep in mind for big websites like Google, the IP address might change because they have different servers distributing the load at different times. And the ping command is also useful if you're having trouble accessing a certain website, you can try pinging it to see if it even responds. Now the other similar command is called tracert, which is kind of like ping, except it shows every single hop your connection makes on the way to its final connection. 
Obviously, when you connect to a website using the internet, the data isn't a straight shot to the website servers. It must first go to your ISP, which might relay it to another place or several before finally reaching the website. Running Tracert followed by the domain will show you each of those intermediate connections along with the average latency up to that point, though this will take a bit longer than the ping command to finish. So this command can be potentially useful if you're diagnosing a misbehaving internet connection because you can see exactly where there are any issues. For example, if you have no internet connection at all, you can run Tracert on some website and see if the connection even makes it past your router, which would suggest a problem with your local network, not your ISP. Okay, next up we have a nifty little command called FC, which stands for file compare. You can run it by typing FC, then the location of one file, and another, and in this example, I'm already in the directory with the file, so I don't need to put the whole path. And then, like the name suggests, it will tell you if the files are exactly the same or not, and if they are text-based files, what those differences are. So in my example, I have a.txt and b.txt, which are both empty, and it says there are no differences. So if I add some text to b.txt and whatever to a.txt, it will now show those as differences. Now this will technically work for any kind of file, even images and rich text files like MS Word docx files, but those exact differences won't be recognizable because it's not just pure text. So really in most cases, it's just good for determining if a file is exactly the same as another. All right, now before we continue to the rest of the commands, which are especially useful, let me tell you about today's sponsor. Like I mentioned before, Bitdefender Total Security 2020 has a wide array of features, such as network threat prevention which can stop attacks before they begin by blocking malicious attempts on system vulnerabilities and brute force attacks. Plus, there's advanced threat defense, which detects suspicious processes based on their behavior. It also has multi-layer ransomware protection, which keeps your important files safe, even from the most advanced ransomware attacks. This includes ransomware remediation, which basically instantly backs up any files it detects is trying to be encrypted by ransomware and restores it after that malware is blocked. And on top of all that, there's even a VPN included for securing your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. With that, you get 200 megabytes per day per device of bandwidth, but it is upgradable to premium. So again, be sure to check out the link in the description for an extended four month free trial if you're a new user based in the US or Canada. All right, so moving on, these next two commands I'll also combine into one, but they're both very important commands. They are the SFC, or System File Checker command, and the DISM command, which is short for Deployment Image Servicing and Management. Complicated names aside, what these tools do is check the integrity of Windows core system files and repairs them if it finds any errors. They are invaluable if you're ever having problems with Windows and suspect corrupted system files. So to use them, you'll probably need to run CMD as administrator, and the first command you'd run is sfc space slash scan now, which will check for damaged system files and automatically attempt to repair them. After it's done, ideally you'll see a message that it did not find any integrity violations, which just means it found no issues. If it did find errors, it may or may not succeed in fixing them automatically. And just by chance, when I was recording this, it did actually find corrupted files, and fortunately, it says it successfully repaired them. If it fails to repair, don't worry, we're not done yet, we still have to do the other command. So let it try, and in either case, whether it found errors and fixed them, or it didn't find any errors, you should restart the computer before continuing to the next command, just in case. So then, after restarting, you can do the following command, which is DISM, slash online, slash cleanup dash image, slash restore health. And I'll put that in the description, by the way, so you can just copy and paste it. This command will also check and repair some different system files. And oftentimes, it will actually repair files that the SFC command needs to repair its files. So after it finishes, hopefully it should say there was no corruption detected, but if it does, hopefully it will fix anything. And then after this process completes, you should again restart the computer and then run SFC slash scan now again, because the DISM command may have repaired files that will now allow the system file checker to repair any files it failed to before. And hopefully by the end of all that, everything will be fixed. Okay, on to number six, we have another classic and essential command, which is check disk or chk dsk. This one is easily one of the most important commands of them all, and it finds and attempts to repair any disk errors. The typical way to run this command is to type check disk 
and then whatever drive letter you want to check, probably the C drive, so C colon, and then slash R. The slash R parameter tells the tool to check for both disk errors and bad sectors and try to repair them both. In most cases, it will probably tell you that the command will require a restart to run, especially if it's the system drive, because it will have to run the program when the drive is not in use. Even if it's a secondary drive though, you probably don't want to force dismount it if it's in use, so you can just schedule that to restart too. So just restart the computer and it will do its thing on startup, and I just ran it on a thumb drive though, so it doesn't matter. And then you can just let it go and hopefully it won't find anything or at least fix any issues it does find. On the thumb drive, for example here, you can see that it found no errors. Up to number seven, we have two commands that go hand in hand, which are the task list and task kill commands. You can probably figure out what these do just by the names. Task list will show a list of processes running on the computer, just like what the task manager already does. And it will also show the process ID of each under the PID column. Though you can also have the process ID show in task manager by right clicking to add that column. So nothing here so far is very unique. And obviously you can also use the task manager to kill processes by hitting end task, but sometimes even that doesn't work and the process just keeps going. In that case, the task kill command may work instead. What you do is type task kill, then slash F and slash T, and then either slash IM with the name of the process or slash PID with the process ID number. The slash F parameter is to forcefully terminate the process and the slash T parameter also terminates any child processes started by the one you're terminating, which is sometimes a reason task manager is unable to end one. Just be sure to run CMD as admin, but task kill should hopefully work if task manager fails. And if not, you might just need to do the unthinkable and restart the computer. Okay, up to number eight, we got a couple more. So now we come to the power CFG command or power config. Specifically, we'll look at the slash energy and slash battery report parameters for this command, which both generate potentially interesting reports about your computer's power usage. So the first one, power CFG slash energy, when you run it, will observe the system's power consumption for 60 seconds and then generate an HTML report file in its current path, which it will show. And this report will let you know about any potential errors related to system power, though in my case, it's mostly just a bunch of notices about USB devices not going to sleep, which I don't really care about. It's probably going to seem like information overload. So I would just consider this more of a curiosity unless you actually are having power issues with your computer. The other parameter can be used by running power CFG slash battery report and this generates a similar report, but specifically having to do with the battery, assuming your computer has one. I tried running it on my desktop, which does not have a battery, obviously, and it spat out an error. But if it does work for you, the report apparently looks pretty cool, giving you info like full charge capacity, a graph of battery usage, stuff like that, which might be worth looking at. All right, finally, number nine, we have another command which can generate a cool report, this time about your Wi-Fi connection. It's kind of long, but it is NetSH WLAN show WLAN report. And the report file it creates, which can be found in the directory listed, will show all sorts of info. For example, info about Wi-Fi connection sessions, any connections or disconnections from Wi-Fi networks, and info about the Wi-Fi adapter itself. You can also see a graph over time of different events, including errors and other states of the Wi-Fi connection. Near the bottom, you'll also notice it ran some other commands that we talked about, like ipconfig, and includes that in the report. So this report might come in handy if you have been having some weird Wi-Fi connection issues, it might shine some light on what's going on. So hopefully these commands should be useful to you at some point in the future. I wanna give a final thanks to Bitdefender for sponsoring this video. And again, be sure to check that link in the description for that free trial. If you guys wanna keep watching, the next video I'd recommend is one with nine advanced Windows features everyone should know, and I'll put that right here so you can click on it. So thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.